oral statement by the First Minister on the Executive's decisions relating to measures to be taken in response to the increased incidence of the transmission of COVID-19. Before we commence, may I thank members for their patience last night. Ordinarily, I would always seek to give members greater warning of an additional sitting, and I was uh, therefore keen to keep WIPs up to date as much as I could throughout the evening. Members know that I have been focused in recent weeks on ensuring the role of the Assembly is respected and highlighting the expectation that Ministers should bring important matters to this House. Given the seriousness of the situation which we are currently in, I want to welcome the fact that the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have chosen to bring an update on the latest executive decision to the Assembly at this earliest opportunity. These are exceptional times. We are dealing with serious and complex issues. No matter our individual views, I want to acknowledge that both the Executive and the Assembly have difficult choices and decisions to make in these worrying circumstances. I think we all need to recognise that. Therefore, it is right and proper that members have the first opportunity available to raise questions with Ministers this morning on behalf of the communities that we represent. And finally, members, we all know that these uh, sittings do not happen by themselves. So I want to personally express my gratitude to all of the staff who stayed on last evening at short notice, many of them until oh, the midnight hour, and I appreciate their complete dedication to this Assembly. Members, I have received notice from the First Minister that she wishes to make a statement. Members should make sure that their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called, but they can do this by rising in their places, as well as notifying the business office or speaker's table directly. I have a number of names on the list to ask a question, and standing orders do not permit me to extend the time for questions after the statement beyond an hour. Do I therefore remind members to be concise in asking their questions? This is not an opportunity for debate per se, and long introductions will not be accepted. I just do want to stress the, the number of members who want to speak here. I want to enable every member in this House who wishes to uh, ask a question and engage with the First Minister the opportunity to do so. That depends entirely on the cooperation of all the members, so please be concise. I will not allow people to have introdu long introductory statements. Please get to your questions and then let all members have the opportunity to raise their relevant questions on behalf of their constituents. I call the First Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And before I make my statement, can I associate myself with your comments in relation to the staff? and uh, say that we deeply appreciate the work uh, that they did late last night and early this morning uh, in relation to the facilitation of the sitting uh, here today. So uh, I just wanted to make that comment. And Mr Speaker, we wish to provide members with an update on decisions that the executive have taken in relation to essential actions needed to reduce COVID-19 transmission rates. There has been much coverage in the press uh, about variations and restrictions and it is with this in mind, along with the very worrying increase in numbers of cases and hospitalisations, that we have looked at the various levels of restrictions uh, that we need now. We all have a role uh, in, to break this chain, and it's important that we all understand this. People pass COVID onto each other, and uh, that happens in a variety of settings. And limiting our social contacts will play a role in breaking the chain. We have already asked everyone to assist us with this by not gathering in domestic settings, and that has been taken forward in regulations. We also have local restrictions in Derry City and Straban Local Government Council area. But the numbers have continued to rise. The doubling rate is of grave concern, and hospitalisations are on the increase. This is deeply troubling, and more steps are, are now urgently needed. The Executive has discussed and we have concluded that we must put the following measures in place. First of all, maintenance of current household restrictions. This means a continuation of the restriction on meeting indoors and a limit on the number who can meet in a garden. There are existing exemptions for childcare and maintenance uh, and uh, other matters which will stay in place. However, as close contact economy is proposed for closure, it would be consistent with that to prohibit the provision of those services, for example, hairdressing, in a domestic setting. Bubbling is to be limited to a maximum of 10 people from two households. No overnight stays in a private home unless in a bubble. Work from home unless unable to do so. In guidance, we will advise universities and further education to deliver distance learning to the maximum extent possible with only essential face-to-face -face learning, where that is a necessary and unavoidable part of the course. 
closure of the hospitality sector apart from deliveries and takeaway for food, with the existing closing time of 11 o'clock remaining. Other takeaway premises will be then brought into line with hospitality with a closing time of 11 p.m. Retail will stay open. However, there will be urgent engagement with the sector to ensure that retail is doing everything it can to help suppress the virus. Closure of close contact services, apart from those meeting essential health needs, which will be defined in the regulations to ensure continuation of essential health interventions and therapeutics. This will not include complementary treatments. No indoor sport of any kind or organised contact sport involving household mixing other than at elite level. No mass events involving more than 15 people, except for allowed outdoor sporting events where the relevant number for that will continue to apply. Gyms may remain open, but for individual training only, with local enforcement in place. Places of worship are to remain open, with a mandatory requirement to wear face coverings when entering and exiting, and this will not apply to parties to a marriage or civil partnership. Wedding ceremonies and civil partnerships to be limited to 25 people, with no receptions. This will be implemented on Monday, the 19th of October. Venues providing the post-ceremony or partnership celebration may remain open for this purpose this weekend, but may not provide other services for people who are not part of the wedding or partnership, and this will be limited to 25. Funerals and committals to be limited to 25 people, with no pre- or post-funeral gathering. In guidance, no unnecessary travel will be advised. Off licences and supermarkets will not be permitted to sell alcohol after 8 p.m. And we believe the above restrictions should apply for four weeks. And the continuation or amendment of any element would require executive approval. In education, the half-term holiday break will be extended from the 19th to the 30th of October, with schools reopening again on Monday, the 2nd of November. To permit this, the Department of Education will allocate to schools two of the optional days and the remainder of additional time through exceptional closure days. As across other jurisdictions, the issue of schools, along with other considerations, will be kept under continuous review by the Executive in the weeks and months ahead. And we fully appreciate that this will be a difficult and worrying news for a lot of people. The Executive has taken this decision because it is necessary and we discuss the impacts in great detail. And we do not take this step lightly. We want these measures to have two impacts. Firstly, on the COVID transmission rates, which must be turned down now, or we will be in a very difficult place very soon indeed. And secondly, we believe it marks a point where everyone, each and every one of us, can take stock and go back to the social distancing messaging that is vitally important. We will, of course, be engaging with sectors and working on supports as a matter of priority. We are asking all children and young people and their parents to help us in a very particular way during the next few weeks. Please make sure that your children and young people follow the social distancing arrangements during this time, limit socialising as much as possible, and use the time in as positive a way as you can. We will need to exit these arrangements most carefully, they will be put in place during Friday of this week and will be there for four weeks. Any extension or amendment to them will require a decision of the Executive. We must reach a different place on both the numbers and on getting back to the basics of social distancing, and I know that everyone in this chamber will want to work with us on that. Mr Speaker, small acts can have a large and important contribution to managing COVID-19. So wash your hands. Practice social distancing, wear face coverings, small acts, but vitally important. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Colin McGrath, chairperson for the committee for the executive office. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the first minister for her statement this morning. Judging by the hundreds of messages that I received overnight, people across the north went to bed last night not knowing if their children would be going to school today, if businesses would be opening, or if they needed to go to work. And the confusion over the past 24 hours has certainly not helped that. We need to approach this pandemic together as equal partners and do the heavy lifting within our communities together. So let this be the moment, the clean break, 
uh, where we provide people with the clarity, with the answers and the support that, and the direction that they need. This statement is welcome, but what is missing is the specific financial detail desperately needed by businesses and workers. We know that one furlough scheme is about to end and another one due to commence soon, but in light of this statement today, can I ask the First Minister what specific and tailored help will there now be to prevent people making the impossible choice between their family's health and their family finances? I thank the Chairman for his intervention. And I mean, there was never going to be a situation where we were going to announce overnight that people had to do something the next day. I mean, that was never going to happen, which is why uh, these restrictions will come into force on Friday to give people time to plan. In terms of the schools, um, the schools were planning to take a week off for Halloween break, most of them. Some were taking four days, some were taking six days, but in the main, uh, around a week. The Education Minister has proposed a way forward to minimise the loss of learning uh, for our young people. I think that's hugely important. Um, others would have wanted to have closed the schools for a longer period of time. Fundamentally, the education of our young people is a right, and absolutely their life chances need to be protected. So I am content uh, that the Education Minister, in terms of what he has proposed, has thought very long and hard about how he can help to reduce the COVID incidents, but also protect uh, those young people. Yesterday, the leader of the SELP told the executive to get on with putting uh, these restrictions in place. We had a very long, a very thoughtful executive meeting last night. Very difficult decisions were taken, uh, Mr Speaker. I don't shy away from that. I don't shy away from the fact uh, that a lot of these decisions will uh, make a huge impact on people's lives. But they are for four weeks. We're very determined that this will be a time-limited intervention. Uh, they are. Uh, I mean, they will not continue past those four weeks. The executive will have to revisit this uh, again at that time. And it is important to say that we will be putting supports in place. We put, uh, the discussion last night was around what interventions we needed to take. Tomorrow, the executive will discuss the support systems that will be in place, uh, and I hope we'll be able to sign off on those support uh, systems, because the member is right in this. We need to support our businesses, our employees, as they go through this most difficult of time. And I hope, Mr. Speaker, that member after member, when they get up today, won't be trying to make trite political points, because this is not the time for trite political points. This is the time for trying to find solutions for every one of our citizens as we face into this terrible situation together. And I hope that we will have that cooperation right across the House today. Thank you. And I call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the First Minister for her statement uh, so far. First Minister, with regard to education and, and young people's welfare, what evidence did the executive balance up to come to this decision of the additional week or, or approximately an additional week of closure and the impact that would have on them? So I just want us to know what evidence you, you weighed up. Well, as I've indicated, the uh, Education Minister uh, was very clear that we did not want to uh, inflict any more damage to our young people. We realise that they have been off school for a considerable length of time due to uh, the lockdown uh, in March. Um, and we had to look at you know, the impact that this would have on uh, peer socialisation, the whole culture of going to school and, uh, and having that school experience. Of course, the loss of learning time is very critical as well. Uh, young people need to be able to take those exams at the end of the year so that their life chances uh, are there for them. Uh, we did have to obviously consider uh, the impact on vulnerable children, uh, children with special educational needs, uh, to make sure that uh, they were covered as well, which is why uh, we are only taking uh, the route of the Halloween break as was, uh, plus a number of extra days. Um, I think it is right that we minimise this as much as we possibly can for our young people, recognising that at the same time we're trying to get the COVID transmission rate under control. 
Uh, that is why uh, the break is starting now, so that we can have that maximum impact starting now. Uh, and I hope that we will be able to see that. But this is a two-week break. Children will return to school on the 2nd of November, and I think that's hugely important uh, that I say that today. I call Colin Gildernew. I'd like to thank the First Minister for coming to make this statement today. While it is beyond doubt that these measures are now absolutely necessary and indeed urgent, it's also the case that they will, as you have mentioned, Joint First Minister, have implications and knock-on impacts. The system in place to test and trace has struggled to cope. So will the Executive use this opportunity and this time to reboot and to put in place an effective find, test, trace, isolate and support system so that every element of that system is working so that to ensure we do not find ourselves back in this place again? Well, I think the member raises uh, an important point about the capacity uh, of our health service and I think that is one that we will have to revisit uh, over the next number of weeks. Uh, obviously, um, the health service and the test, trace and protect system is fundamentally at first point uh, a matter for the health minister, and I'm sure he will be making his own commentary today uh, in relation to all of these matters. But it is very important that we have a health service, which we know was under pressure before we came back uh, in January. Uh, but we need to have a health service that is um, scaled up uh, in the coming days, that is fit for purpose. Uh, one that has the capacity, one that is reforming, although I accept it's very difficult to reform when we're in this crisis situation. Um, but if we need to have mutual aid and if we need to have assistance from the rest of the United Kingdom, then we shouldn't stop ourselves from asking for that help and assistance. At present, uh, we are managing the ICU beds, we are managing the hospital uh, capacity, um, but we do need to take these interventions to make sure that we can continue uh, to deal with the ICU capacity and all of the other problems. In terms of test, trace, protect and isolate, there are different elements of that and he's right to mention that and it was good to hear from the Communities Minister last night that actually we were ahead of the game in terms of supporting people who had to isolate with our discretionary payment system. And uh, Again, when we look at the various ranges of supports that we will have in place tomorrow, uh, we will be saying uh, more about those issues. But we felt it was important that we came to the House today to outline um, uh, the issues in terms of the restrictions, but we will have much more to say tomorrow about the supports that will be in place to try and assist people, whether they have to self-isolate or whether there are people whose businesses have to close uh, across those four weeks to try and help us get this COVID uh, virus under control. Thank you. And I call Steve Egan. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker, and thank you very much indeed for the First Minister for coming for making this statement to us today. And I would like, on behalf of the Ulster Unionist Party, to pass on our thanks to the Northern Ireland Executive and all the parties within the Northern Ireland Executive for coming to these particular difficult decisions in the time that we had to make them in, that, in this challenging circumstances, particularly on the impact on our health service. But the question I would like to ask the First Minister, bearing in mind the importance of what we need to do to make societal changes, what are we doing to ensure that our executive and the parties that are supporting our executive are there to make sure that we communicate effectively, we deal with these issues, and we all collectively work together to ensure that this message goes out to the people of Northern Ireland that we have to make these changes because we do not have the time. Our health service does not have the time. We have to make these changes. I thank the member for his commentary and, and I'm sure executive colleagues will thank him for his um, position in relation to our decision um, last night. Um, look, the health minister has been very clear with us in relation to the capacity of the health service that if we hadn't taken interventions last night, and which I'm communicating to you today, that um, our health service would not have been able to deal with what was coming down the line and that was very concerning for all of us. These are very difficult decisions because, uh, as all of us know, we are being asked about elective surgery, we're being asked about cancer care, we're being asked about all of those things. But I think what people need to understand is, because we're having to spend so much time dealing with the rise in COVID, we then have to turn off elective surgery and all of those things. So the two things are intertwined in that way. 
Uh, and if we don't take action personally, all of us personally, then the rise of COVID will stop all of those other things from happening. And sometimes I listen to people and they say, um, we're not doing enough uh, in terms of surgery, we're not doing enough in terms of heart disease and all of those other things. Uh, and that's because of the rise of COVID and because people aren't taking personal responsibility for their own behaviour. So if we get anything out of today, Mr Speaker, and it is about us all having a message that people need to take personal responsibility for their actions, then I think that will be a very positive thing coming out of the Assembly today. Because what we all want to do, I think, I hope, is to protect the health service, minimise the number of deaths that occur, and also protect our economy and the well-being of society here in Northern Ireland. It is about that balance. I've talked about it all week, trying to take proportionate action, trying to take a balanced way forward, and that's what we were trying to do last evening. I'm going to call Stuart Dixon. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, uh, First Minister, for your statement. And I have to agree with you that you will not find the Alliance Party uh, disagreeing with you when you say that the public health message must be the first message and our first priority. However, there are businesses out there across Northern Ireland who will be hurting today. There will be businesses making very difficult decisions, not just about the support that this, this, this executive is going to give them, but whether the there is a future for their business. Can you assure businesses across Northern Ireland that urgent action will be taken to set out clear support for them? I thank the member for his question. Uh, absolutely. Uh, as the member knows, the Chancellor uh, announced uh, new supports which will kick in on the 1st of November. It is not as generous as the furlough scene that was in place uh, uh, with the lockdown back in March. Of course, we are not in a lockdown situation now. We are putting in interventions for a limited period of time. But that doesn't take away the fact that a lot of businesses will be suffering. They will be worried. And I've talked about this many times, um, that we get uh, bad health outcomes if people are unemployed, if they're in poverty, if they uh, are in a situation where they can see no way out. And we have to give them that hope and that determination that there will be better days. But there will be better days if people take personal responsibility for their actions, Mr Speaker. And I know people think uh, it doesn't apply to me because uh, uh, I'm fine and if I get it, I get it and that's it. But the point is they are impacting upon our hospitals, they're impacting upon our economy, they're impacting upon the whole way of life here in Northern Ireland. So I plead with people today. Please take personal responsibility for your actions. Please work with us so that we can, as we did in March and April, get this virus under control. People looked at this part of the world and said, Northern Ireland's doing very well. I want to get back to that place again, but I can only do it if people work with us all. And I hope um, that people who are affected by the decisions today, and I know there are many people affected by our decisions today, will want to see what we have to say tomorrow in relation to specific supports, and I very much hope that we can sign off on those tomorrow at the Executive. I'm going to call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, can I thank the First Minister um, so far for her answers? Um, First Minister, I want to go back to the issue of education again. Um, just Can you share with us any of the evidence that you were shown, um, or the executive was shown, around the risk? And are there any other ways of mitigating that risk? I know, again, as an MLA, I have received emails from headmasters and headmistresses from various schools wanting to know why they're having to have this extra week. And also, you'd also mentioned there about SEN. And I just want to ask, you know, how seriously was the balance taken with special educational needs, schools and children, given the fact that many of those children um, need that stability and need structure in their lives? Well, can I absolutely concur with her in relation to children with special educational needs? We know during lockdown that many of those young people I mean, it was so, so very difficult for them and for their parents. I uh, recall an email, Mr Speaker, from a lady in Craig Avon who told me that her child was in such a way of going to their place of education every day that despite the fact that the school wasn't open, she had to drive him to it every day because that's the routine that he was in. And so these decisions have weighed very heavily on us today and um, particularly protecting our young people, which is why we have kept the school closure to an absolute minimum. And I think that that was the right thing to do. 
Children would be off for half term in any event, and we've just lengthened that uh, by a couple of days. And I know for some parents that that will be a challenge in terms of childcare, but I hope that giving them that extra time to plan uh, over the next couple of days will assist in that. In terms of the schools and the incidence of COVID in schools, uh, the Public Health uh, Agency have been doing some work uh, with the Education Department. They have told us as of Sunday evening that they had 485 incidents risk assessed with schools, many incidents involving a single case. Uh, less than 10 schools have required support uh, for two or more incidences. And the overall assessment, as advised by the Public Health Agency, not the Department of Education, the Public Health Agency, is that there is limited transmission in school settings. Now, there are other issues around school gates and around transport and issues like that. And uh, we are going to work with the Department of Education to look at how we can minimise the risk around some of those issues. But in the school setting, uh, there is a limited transmission according to the PHA. So I, th I welcome that because it gives us clarity uh, in relation to schools. I know there are a lot of parents who are worried uh, about their young people and they should look at that evidence uh, and take some reassurance from that. I call Cahill Boylan. Cahill Boylan. I can call you August Nonaira and I thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the Minister for answer so far. Clearly, Minister, the decision to close the schools has been a difficult one for the executive and indeed for all of us, but it's based on medical and scientific advice and it's a necessary step. So could I ask the Minister to outline the focus of the review in two weeks' time to ensure that we keep taking the right decisions, even if those decisions are very difficult? Well, thanks to the member for his question. and It has been a very difficult decision, not just around schools, but around all of the different interventions uh, that we're taking. Uh, we very uh, firmly are of the opinion um, that school, uh, the intervention in schools should be for as short as period as possible. Um, there were demands for a longer open-ended lockdown in terms of schools, and we believe a limited intervention is best, which we can then assess um, to see what the impact is. But as I've indicated to the member, um, the overall assessment by the Public Health Agency is that there is limited transmission in school settings, uh, whilst there may be some issues uh, outside of school that we will need to try and mitigate against uh, in terms of the school settings. And I, I mean, that just doesn't happen. Uh, there's been a lot of work that has gone into that uh, by staff and teachers and schools and by the young people themselves. Um, and I, I really do want to acknowledge that because I was speaking to a uh, school principal this morning on the way up the road from Fermanagh, and she was saying to me, that young people are very resilient and work very well uh, when they know what is expected of them. Uh, and I think we should pay tribute to our young people and the way in which they have dealt with what is a strange time. We all remember our school days, uh, and certainly for me, there was no putting a mask on when you got onto a bus and putting a mask on when you were walking down a corridor and having to stay in the same classroom whilst your teachers moved around. Uh, so I do want to say, uh, Mr Speaker, that I pay tribute to all of our young people as they deal with this strangest of time. Thank you. I call Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I wish to place on record my condolences to all of the families who have lost a loved one through this hateful virus and appeal to everyone to follow the law and the guidance to the letter to avoid more preventable deaths. I thank the First Minister for her statement, which is not welcome but entirely necessary. What advice is now available for those previously shielding um, and can the First Minister give an update on the utilising of the Belfast City Tower Block facility and will there be provision for key workers um, who are on the front line, uh, particular uh, healthcare workers within schools for childcare? I thank the member for her question. In terms of the last point about key workers, because the schools are closed for a limited period of time, and because um, the uh, half-term holidays were happening in any event, I think it would be very difficult uh, to have provision in schools for uh, key workers. I regret that. Obviously, if it had been for a longer period of time, um, then we would have had to find a way around that. As she knows, we, uh, unlike the Republic of Ireland, kept our schools open for uh, key workers uh, during uh, the March lockdown, uh, and uh, indeed people availed of that, and we're very glad that that was there for many people who had to 
uh, go to work uh, and to facilitate uh, the rest of us as key workers. In terms of uh, the Nightingale facility, um, uh, it is being stood up, uh, but at the moment only on a Belfast Trust basis, not on a regional basis. Uh, it may well come quite quickly that we'll have to stand it up uh, on a regional basis, and uh, more people are requiring specialist clinical care and intensive care units. Um, that was the case in the Matter Hospital and in the Royal Victoria Hospital, so it was felt uh, that there was a need across the Belfast Trust to expand COVID ICU from the Matter and, Belf uh, and uh, RVH and to relocate into the tower block at Belfast City Hospital. Um, so that is a, a step that we hoped we wouldn't have to make again. Uh, if I was a prophet or a daughter of a prophet, I would probably say that I expect the Nightingale Hospital on a regional basis to be in place pretty soon. Um, I regret that that is the case, but I think that we will need to put that in to facilitate and make sure that we have enough uh, ICU beds to deal with the hospitalisations uh, that unfortunately are increasing on a daily basis, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Nicole. Sinead Ennis. And, um, I want to acknowledge the fact that these decisions have not been taken lightly today. They have been taken with the, the best interests and, and public health at its core, um, and that should not be forgotten. Uh, going back to Stuart Dixon's comment around, the, uh, around businesses and jobs and um, the huge challenges that are now facing those businesses, um, while those businesses are ordered to close, we'll be able to access the extended uh, JSS from the beginning of November uh, when furlough ends. There will be businesses uh, in the supply chain impacted also. So will the executive ask the economy minister to look at supporting those businesses that also face loss of earnings? Uh, yeah, and the member raises a very, very pertinent point actually uh, about supply chain and something that the economy minister and I have already uh, had conversations around because whilst... Um, if businesses are closed in the hospitality sector, for example, they can avail of the, the new supports that are there. Uh, the supply chain can't because we're not ordering them to close. Uh, and I think we as an executive need to be very conscious of that. And it's certainly something that we will want to try and assist with. Um, we'll not be able to mitigate against all of the losses. I think it's only right that I'm honest and open about that. Uh, but I think it's also important that we try and support them as much as we can. We do have extra funding now in terms of the Barna Consequential that came across from the Chancellor, which he announced on Friday, in the region of £200 million. Uh, And I understand that there's other money uh, available in terms of the COVID spend that we already had as well. So we do have, I think, in the region of £300 million, uh, to deal with these issues. But as the Economy Minister pointed out to us last night, uh, when she intervened, with the grant systems, the £10,000 and the £25,000 uh, grants, uh, that cost in the region of £340 million. So the scale of this uh, is very big. Uh, we are not in a similar situation to March because we are not in lockdown. And uh, businesses can continue, work can continue. But for those sectors that we are specifically closing, we do have to find mechanisms to help them. And that certainly is the focus moving on from today and tomorrow. I call Justin McNulty. Gurumai Yogurt, Count Corla. First Minister, the CMO, Megan McBride, who has been solid as a rock throughout this pandemic, is on record saying that he'd be happy for his guidance to be published. First Minister, people, individuals, families, businesses are now even more anxious, fearful and confused. Given the severity of this situation and the impacts of the proposals, being made here today, do you intend to publish the CMO's guidance? We do need to break the chains of transmission of this virus, but we also need to break the chains of transmission of anxiety and fear, and of speculation and of conspiracy. And First Minister, can you tell the people we will defeat this virus if we all play our part and work together? Well, I would love to break the uh, transmission of conspiracies and fake news that emanate from this place uh, on a day and daily basis, but unfortunately that's not a matter for me, that's a matter for other people uh, who decide to leak uh, half tr truths and half stories, and then that does cause anxiety, and it does cause concern amongst people right across Northern Ireland. And Mr Speaker, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to come to this House today and to set out very clearly what the Executive actually had agreed, as opposed to what people think we have agreed today. And uh, when the member talks about um, 
the medical advice from uh, Dr McBride, who has been uh, a great help and support to the executive, as indeed has our chief scientific advisor. Uh, very helpfully, somebody leaked the executive paper on Monday of this week uh, with all of Dr McBride's advice in it. So that's already out in the public domain. I don't think that was helpful because, as I've said from this uh, uh, place many, many times, this is a balanced approach that we need to take. It's about health. It's about the economy. It's about society. It's about the family that we all uh, love and want to cherish and care for. And so we have to take things in the round. And that's why yesterday, when we met as an executive, we had many decisions to take, and many uh, assessments to make, many risk assessments to take. Uh, and that's what we were doing late into uh, the night. And I think we have come up with a package which, frankly, uh, because we're in a five-party coalition, uh, we have to try and get the consensus and move forward together. I make no apology for that. I think that's what people want us to do to move forward together. If it was left to one individual party or another, uh, it would probably be a different announcement uh, today. But we have come to this executive decision. We now have to all abide by that executive decision and make it work for all of the people of Northern Ireland and to cut out the transmission uh, of the virus. That will only happen if people take personal responsibility, listen to what we're saying in terms of guidance and regulations, and work together for the good of everybody. Paul Meg Nesbitt. Mr. Speaker, thank you, and I thank the Minister for, for her statement. Uh, the PSNI have previously characterised the pandemic as a, a health rather than a policing crisis and are approaching it with a strategy of the, the four E's of engage, educate, encourage, and finally enforce. Uh, may I ask the First Minister what discussions she's had with the Minister for Justice to ensure appropriate enforcement of these new measures? I thank the member for his question. I think uh, enforcement is very important. Um, I accept the strategy of the police in trying to uh, inform and uh, educate and encourage people um, to do the right thing. Um, but we also must get to the point at some stage for uh, some of those recalcitrant people who will not do the right thing um, that there are penalties in place to deal with that. And the Justice Minister, as the member will know, has brought forward to the executive uh, new penalties, which we ratified last week. And as well as that, the executive has uh, their enforcement uh, group, which is working not just with the Police Service of Northern Ireland, but with local government, uh, with environmental health, uh, and indeed with the health and safety executive. And I hope as well with some of the larger retail sectors. I said in my statement, Mr. Speaker, that we would be engaging with the retail sector. We haven't closed the retail sector. It is still open. But we want to work with them uh, to mitigate uh, against uh, some of the uh, com compl compliance issues that very clearly are there at present. And I hope that they will work with us to try and make sure that we uh, make sure that their staff are safe and that their customers are safe as well. So that's what we want to do. And we will be doing that over the next couple of days. And I call Jim Allister. Sure, the last 24 hours have been far from confidence building. For weeks we were told, apparently in medical advice, that our homes were the danger spots and pubs were safe, and you could see your granny in the pub, so to speak. Now we're told that hospitality has to close, and of course the great losers in that will be some of the lowest paid in our society. Our schools Kids have had 28 days of schooling in seven months, and now they are to close. What assurances are that we're not just going into lockdown by stages, that if things aren't better in a fortnight, that our schools will reopen, uh, and meanwhile off licenses are open? My specific question is this. Are our schools expected during these two weeks to also provide the facilities for key workers. There's been some teachers have been diligently in school since March. Does that have to continue? And in respect of sporting events, can, for example, Irish league matches continue with the present level of supporters? Um, in terms of the Irish league matches, those are um, assessed as elite sports, and uh, the spectators that have been risk assessed. Um, can continue, as I understand it. 
Um, in terms of key workers, as I indicated to Ms Cameron, um, because it's such a short closure, um, it's not actually a closure at all, it's just a lengthening of the holidays. Um, we won't be able to facilitate, as I understand, the key workers, in, children in school. Um, so teachers will be off for those two weeks. They won't be in school uh, during that period of time. He's right to um, highlight the fact that off licences uh, will be closed early. I think that that is an important point. The rationale for that, of course, is that if public houses and other hospitality venues are closed, uh, then uh, at night time there may be a situation where people would seek alcohol uh, and then go to house parties. And of course, he's right to say that homes and house parties <coughs> are still an issue that need to be dealt with. And indeed, anywhere where your social contact is increased. And that's why I'm asking people, pleading with people around personal responsibility and cutting down on the number of social contacts that you have. And if you are in contact with people, that you uh, social distance, uh, if you're in uh, a retail environment, that you wear a mask, uh, and that you do all of the things that we're trying to do to cut down on the transmission of the virus. This is a serious moment for Northern Ireland, Mr Speaker. And people will either work with us or they'll decide uh, that they'll go their own way. But the, going their own way has consequences and has huge consequences for our health service. And they should remember that because everyone uses our health service, not just those with COVID-19. I call Jerry Carl. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to categorically say what happened last night was an absolute shambles, and people are scratching their head asking what's going on up in this building. I want to ask the First Minister, does she agree with me that a much better approach to tackling this virus would be adopting a zero COVID strategy and implementing the necessary financial assistance for the vulnerable, rather than having an endless cycle uh, of circuit breaker and surge which would undoubtedly cause greater harm to the health and livelihoods in the long run, especially of low-paid workers? Well, as the uh, member always raises, he thinks that there's a magic money tree at the bottom of the road. There isn't a magic money tree. The money has to come from somewhere. I have to say that the UK government have stepped up to the plate in relation to the furlough scheme, in relation to the financial assistance that we have received. Uh, during this pandemic, again, the Chancellor has come forward with a scheme which I recognise is not as generous uh, as the furlough scheme. Of course I do. But the money has to be paid back sometime. We are now in a huge amount of debt as a nation, and that will have consequences for our young people in the future. And our young people have suffered enough through this pandemic, to be quite blunt, uh, and we need to find a way to deal with that. But we will be putting in support uh, for our businesses. I think it's important to say that. The executive will meet tomorrow. Currently, Minister for Finance, Minister for the Economy uh, are both working on these issues, and we will discuss them in detail tomorrow at the executive. Nicole Clare Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her statement. I also wish to acknowledge uh, the Health Minister being in the chamber. Sadly, uh, the Northern Ireland Executive has treated this House with contempt over the last number of days, so I do appreciate you being here and finally giving this House the respect that it deserves. Um, First Minister, will there be guidance in the next 24 hours to add meat to the bones of some of the announcements that you have made? Already I'm being bombarded with questions, and I will do my best to answer them, but I'm struggling to do that on the basis of what is here. I appreciate the regulations themselves will perhaps go into that detail, but you know, if there was a piece of work to be done, it would be about giving clarity to the audience, the people who need the information. And can I also ask, when uh, you're developing a financial package for these businesses who will have to close uh, through uh, government instruction, will you be mindful of those businesses who will be directly impacted by closures for, in hotels, for example, so musicians, um, uh, other, other businesses that work within them, whose businesses will go from zero, literally from Friday, or even from Monday. Um, and how are we going to support them? Because sadly, some of those businesses haven't been supported up until now, and this will only compound the issue, not least for them, but for the wider economy. Thank you. I thank the member for a question, although I don't accept that we're treating this House with contempt. As you know, Mr Speaker, I've been in front of you on a number of occasions last week and this week. Uh, the Minister of Health uh, considers this uh, chamber to be his second home. Uh, and so it's wrong to say that we treat this place with contempt. Very, very wrong. Uh, in terms of uh, help for artists 
Um, we're very much aware of the issue that she raises. As I understand it, the Minister for Communities has put together a scheme uh, which she will be rolling out very soon because, of course, a lot of the artists uh, that she speaks about and the event organisers and what have you have not been able to uh, find work or been able to work for quite a considerable length of time. So I know the Minister for Communities uh, is very much uh, aware of that issue uh, and will be dealing with that issue. Um, in terms of the questions and answers, yes, the regulations will bring more clarity in relation to the issues uh, that we decided last night, but there will also be, as I understand it, and I'm sure she'll keep me uh, to this, a question and answers uh, digest on Northern Ireland Direct, which will be published as soon as we can uh, do that, Mr Speaker, because I absolutely accept that there will be many, many questions that will be asked by our constituents right across Northern Ireland, so it's important that we try and get that information out to members. Can I call Joanne Bundy? Thank you, Mr Speaker, and my question follows on from others. The World Health Organisation says it specifically doesn't support draconian restrictions or lockdowns, and they should only be used to buy time to prepare. It also says that poverty will double, as will mental ill health cases, in the next year if this continues. As the First Minister has outlined, the debt is rising and there are going to be fewer and fewer people in work to pay for it. So what's being done to protect jobs? And more specifically, will the First Minister clarify, is the Executive looking at help for those who have received none to date? And what is meant by essential health needs? Thank you. Well, just in relation to that very last point, essential health needs will be defined um, in the question and answers document that we will put out because I absolutely accept that my essential health needs might not be somebody else's essential health needs. So there, there is a need for clarification in relation to that and we will we'll get that out as soon as we possibly can. Uh, except what the member says about the World Health Organization saying that lockdown should only be the last resort and a uh, time to prepare, to deal and to get the capacity dealt with. Uh, very clearly, this is not a lockdown. Work continues. Uh, people will be working from home where it's not possible, uh, to, uh, where it's uh, possible, and uh, other work will continue. Retail remains open. Manufacturing remains open, except the points about supply chain and the hospitality sector. Of course, that is something uh, that we need to look at. Uh, this is a difficult time, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we will need to bring forward supports for those parts of the economy that are being impacted by this decision that we made last night. And as I say, we will have those discussions tomorrow, hopefully with announcements thereafter. Thank you, and I call Pachihim. I thank the First Minister for her uh, statement this morning. Um, uh, I listened to the First Minister say in response to a question from another member this morning that the clear message coming out from the executive is that people have to take responsibility. And of course, that's absolutely true. However, people are also asking us, what are we doing as political leaders and as the executive to do our part in dealing with this virus? Some countries have been much more successful in, in, uh, in, in uh, dealing with this virus uh, and they have used much more nuanced methods and tools to fight it than we have been doing here. Because despite the First Minister's assertion earlier that this is only going to last for four weeks, if we don't get our act together, uh, we're going to have to impose more restrictions. The fact is, the impositions of restrictions like this and the first lockdown were a blunt instrument. Uh, and if we don't start putting in place a proper system of rigorous testing, tracing, isolating and supporting, then we're going to be faced with more and more restrictions in the future. Would the First Minister not agree with that? Well, I, I do think that personal responsibility is a huge part of this. Uh, I would say to the member that whilst we can put all of the restrictions in as a government um, uh, as we desire, if they're not complied with, then the virus will continue to spread. Uh, and therefore, people need to take uh, personal responsibility for their actions, uh, and they need to understand why it's important. I accept we have a role in that, in terms of laying out why it's important that they take these decisions. Um, I look across uh, Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, I, I see what they're doing in terms of targeted interventions. Uh, I think the Netherlands last night had a similar intervention uh, as we have been talking about today. Uh, this is a time-limited intervention. 
Uh, it is an intervention that we hope will bring the R number below one. At the minute, the R number is about 1.4, 1.5. We need to get it below one because then that takes away the, the transmission of the virus doubling and what have you. So it's important that we get the R below one, and that's what this intervention is about. Uh, and when that happens, then we can come out of the intervention. But that doesn't mean that we then go about as if everything's normal again. We still will then have to do the basics around social distancing, around washing our hands, and that's the problem. Because in the summer, we became uh, quite lax, quite relaxed. We thought things had to come back to normal, but unfortunately, the virus was still there. And as a result, we're now in a situation where we're having to take these interventions, uh, and I regret that, that is the case. I very much regret that that is the case. But nothing about this is inevitable. And if people now um, take personal responsibility to themselves and start doing the right things, then we can ensure uh, that this intervention is the intervention that made the difference and stopped the transmission of the virus. Thank you. I'm going to call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our health, our economy, our education, our well-being rely on everyone in our community complying with this guidance. And this is a stark wake-up call to everyone in our community that we must comply with this guidance to protect life and livelihood. Can I ask the First Minister, will formal childcare and school-based childcare remain open? And what evidence led to a ban on youth sports rather than spectator gathering at youth sports? Well, in terms of childcare, childcare uh, continues as is. There's no change uh, in respect of childcare. We think that that is very important because we know the pressure that parents were under uh, during the March lockdown. Um, School-based childcare, uh, by that I think he means after schools and things like that, obviously won't happen because the children are uh, on a holiday uh, and there will be nobody at the schools. In terms of the youth-based contact sports, uh, obviously the contact sports uh, are not now happening for everyone apart from elite sports um, uh, and uh, that uh, we think will hope we hope will stop the transmission of the virus I, his his reference to spectators is well made because I think there's been some bad examples in terms of spectators um, we've seen them uh, across this past number of weeks and for, unfortunately we've seen the consequences as well we've seen clusters and spikes in various places, uh, and I think that there's no accident in relation to any of that. So, spectators uh, at Irish League games, at rugby, uh, and at other elite sports will continue, but they will be very much socially distanced. They will be regulated. We will work with the different sporting codes to make sure that that is the case. And of course, all of these things will be looked at again in the round. Thank you. And can I say to that we have a further six speakers who wish to uh speak and if all the members will take a shortcut to their question we may just get them all in so please keep your questions concise christopher stalford try not to take that as a hint don't take it personally um, thank you very much uh, mr speaker firstly can i thank my right honorable friend for the statement that she has made I, I think it is important the health messaging was not undermined by my right honorable friend at any point and she has striven valiantly to do her best throughout this crisis Others, including a signature to this statement, had a hand in undermining public confidence in the health messaging. The measures announced will impact upon the lowest paid, particularly in the hospitality sector. Can I ask for further information in that regard? And further, yesterday's newsletter editorial stated, it's incredible that school closures could even be on the table, especially as the idea, idea was rejected in the <coughs> Prime Ministers in the Republic of Ireland. Can I ask my right honourable friend to resist absolutely in the executive any attempt to extend the closure of our schools because it is crucially important that our children and young people have access to their education. I thank the member for his question. I think we're all uh, very conscious um, of hospitality workers and the fact that many of them <coughs> are on zero hour contracts and on minimum wage. Uh, and when I say that um, the, the new job scheme is not as um, generous as the furlough scheme. It is those people that I'm thinking of because um, it gives two thirds uh, of payment. And of course, that's only if you're not on a zero hour uh, or if indeed um, uh, you haven't been uh, made redundant and you're a flexible worker. So, I mean, 
we fully accept that and there's a need for us to be aware of that. I'm, I'm hoping that later on today I'll meet with representatives of Hospitality Ulster uh, and we will discuss some of these very important issues. Uh, in terms of education, uh, the member is right to point out that uh, in terms of the closure of education at the highest level of their tiers in the Republic of Ireland and indeed in England, uh, there is no suggestion that education will close. And let me be clear, education is not closing in Northern Ireland. We're just taking an extended holiday break to facilitate the R number being pushed down. We are not closing schools. And I think it's very important that we say that. Schools will come back on the 2nd of November. I want to say that very loudly. I know there's been some commentary this morning uh, from very worried parents thinking, no, this is the start of it. Now we're going to be in a situation where our children aren't going to be at school. We're going to be back in a March-April situation where children aren't getting the learning that they need to, uh, to move ahead with their lives. And so to be very clear, children will return to school on the 2nd of November, and I think that, that is absolutely the right thing to do. Thank you. And I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, First Minister, for your sp statement um, here today. Um, this has been a very difficult decision, I'm sure, for all members of the executive, uh, and we have to get it right, and it's really difficult to get the balance right between lives and livelihoods. And I have a very close friend at the moment that is, is fighting this virus uh, in hospital, uh, and, and so I'm very cognizant of the public health message and, and welcome it here today. But I'm going to uh, ask... A, ask you a question, not my question, but I got this in from a business leader in the city. Bearing in mind, Derry is nine days into these restrictions already. So this is what he said to me this morning. These restrictions are a further disaster for Derry, the lowest paid in hospitality. Most hairdressers and barbers rent a chair. City centre is a scary place right now. Foyside is 77% down on foot footfall. Taxis and small re retailers are on their knees. Never mind poverty. Many will be plunged into destitution. Supporting these restrictions without support going directly to these individuals is enormously dangerous and unforgivable. What would you say to that business leader? I uh, thank the member, and I'm very sorry to hear that she has a, a friend suffering uh, from COVID uh, in hospital, and I, I send my good wishes to her. Um, in terms of the very direct question that you asked me, and I, I do recognise that her local government area have been in these restrictions for a period of time now. We will hopefully see in the next couple of days if they have had an impact in terms of the transmission of the virus. As we know, it always takes a lag time for there to be any impact in terms uh, of the transmission of the virus. Uh, absolutely hear what she's saying in relation to the lowest paid, and uh, we will have that discussion uh, tomorrow to try and give clarity around all of that. Uh, retail remains open, as she knows, but I accept uh, that footfall is down. Uh, and when we first put um, household restrictions um, uh, in places like Ballymena and Belfast, we've seen footfall fall, go down dramatically. Uh, Retail is still open. You can still uh, travel in a taxi with all of the appropriate um, uh, safeguards. Um, but I do accept that there are people who, who will now take this and not want to be out and about. It is OK to be out and about, as long as you take the appropriate safeguards. And I think that that is important, because we do need to try and get that balance of keeping the economy going. I accept, at a lesser level than we would like. but to make sure that we keep people safe as well. And I, she will know that, given um, that her friend is in hospital suffering from COVID, but she has a great passion for the economy of the North West, and I understand that. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for uh, attending this morning. And uh, I'd want to join uh, Pam Cameron and pay tribute to the families who lost uh, loved ones this week due to COVID. I'm sure you'll join with me, Minister. I also want to pay tribute to the many teachers who have, have, have been on their knees for a number of weeks now and have done their best in our schools. Uh, and with regard to uh, our schools and the ongoing pressures that they face, Minister, can you give a commitment that the Executive will support the, uh, the Finance Minister and the Education Minister with regard to the, the needed development of the blended learning and online facilities that may be required for further school omissions and that all um, uh, evidence taken in terms of any further school closures will be from that from the, the Chief Scientific Officer and the Chief Medical Officer? I thank the member for his question, and I do indeed uh, want to, uh, and it was remiss of me not to do it when Ms Cameron uh, raised the issue 
uh, sent my sympathy and empathy to those people who have lost loved ones to COVID-19 and indeed to many other uh, diseases uh, over this past period of time. Uh, in terms of education, um, I, I think I have been clear uh, that the last thing we want to do is to get to a situation uh, where we're in that awful phrase, blended learning again. I don't think it helps children. It's certainly a huge pressure and strain on our teachers. And I want to pay a tribute to our teachers for having to take up that strain um, earlier on this year. Uh, I think I've pointed out that from the PHA's point of view, uh, in schools is a very low transmission rate. Although I do accept that there are issues around the school that we may need to put more mitigations in. Uh, but I think as a policy objective, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, we should always try and ensure that our children have an education and our children are at school. That's certainly what I want to ensure, and I hope that I'll be joined in that with other members of the executive, because whilst I hear what the member is saying uh, about taking interventions in school and blended learning, we have to also take into uh, account the impact that this will have on their life chances in the future and what it will do for, to them from a mental health point of view if they're at home and not integrating with their peers. And I seen that right across the piece when children were at home, maybe uh, lone children, children who are only children at home on their own without any interaction with other younger people. It is not good for children not to be together. And therefore, from my point of view, education should be our number one priority, and I hope that it is for everybody around this chamber. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, given that these restrictions come into effect on Friday, it's crucial that businesses have clarity, First Minister. Uh, will, will you agree, uh, First Minister, to commit and publish the full guidance to businesses by the end of the day and outline the support that will be put in place? Thank you. I thank the member for his question. I absolutely accept that uh, businesses need clarity, they need guidance, they need to see the regulations. That is why uh, these um, restrictions are coming into place on Friday as opposed to today to give time to get all of that dealt with so that people will have that clarity. And I, as I've said many times, I hope that the uh, support package will be signed off tomorrow as well. I call Rachel Woods. Mr Speaker, and to the First Minister and Health Minister for coming today. I note that the closure of some of our sectors while having others open, which surely is a purely political decision on the face of it without seeing the evidence of transmission in certain settings. It's also surely a political decision not to have adequate support in place before today's announcement, but I'm glad to learn that information is due tomorrow. There does remain so many questions. What is unnecessary travel? Is it enforceable? What is a mass event? What happens to hotels and B&Bs? What about those who were shielding before? What do they do? Will there be information for them? But for the hospitality industry, the majority of whom who have gone above and beyond to keep their staff and customers safe in exceptionally difficult circumstances, is the new furlough scheme it? But First Minister, to have a specific question, when do these changes come in exactly? Can you clarify when closures come in for the hospitality sector? Are last orders in pubs and restaurants tomorrow night or Friday? Well, I th the member has covered a, a lot of ground in a very short time, um, but just to say that in relation to shielding, and it's an issue that um, Cameron raised as well, and I uh, didn't get a, a chance to say that. This has been looked at by the chief medical officers across the four nations. Um, the last time she will remember in terms of lockdown, we took a, a huge blanket approach to shielding. I think uh, the chief medical officer told me this week that it was nearly 280. Uh, 1,000 people were shielding, which was incredible, because when we started out, we thought it would be about 80,000 people. Um, so we need to take a more nuanced approach to that. I know that there's a lot of people who are vulnerable, uh, or perhaps older, who are very, very worried at present. And we, we must recognize that. And we shouldn't be using phrases like lockdown, um, because those people will see those phrases and feel that they should be uh, not going out anywhere and, and, and should be just in the house. And they will be very afraid and worried about that. Uh, there will be shielding advice coming forward, but it will be more nuanced and more targeted uh, than it was in the past. I, I do recognize the member's uh, frustration as well that she doesn't have all of the answers. Can I share something with her? I don't have all of the answers. We're dealing with a pandemic. We're dealing at speed. There's a man sitting in front of you who will tell you what it's like to work at speed. And uh, we're trying to work through all of the answers. And uh, the reason that I came to the chamber this morning was to give people a heads up that this is a direction of travel. 
we will have the guidance and the regulation and hopefully all of the answers in place uh, before Friday. And to answer her very specific question, uh, six o'clock on Friday is the target uh, for when these regulations will take effect. Okay, I call Matthew O'Toole. Mr Speaker, um, thank you to the First Minister for coming and giving us this update today. I don't think anyone is in any doubt about the um, extraordinary circumstances we find ourselves in and the fact that the executive is having to work at pace. Um, but First Minister, can I ask you, in relation to the statement today, it doesn't make clear, um, and I would ask you if you would be willing to make clear, that the action being taken today, though I welcome it, and it is absolutely essential given the skyrocketing incidence of the virus here, that today, the purpose of today's actions and the further restrictions is not to suppress the virus, it's not to beat the virus in the short term because it won't do that. We, it's very important that people um, do not think that simp in four weeks' time this virus will go away and it will be okay by Christmas. The blunt truth is that this is about buying time for our health service in order for it not to be overwhelmed. Could she confirm that? And would she also agree with me that it would help in terms of assuring the public about the purpose of this if the full detailed guidance could be published from both the CMO and the Chief Scientific Advisor? I uh, thank the member for his question. Uh, look, um, what we're trying to do, as we've always tried to do, is push down the transmission of the virus to get the R number below one. Uh, at the minute, it's about 1.5. We need to get it below one. So that's what this targeted intervention uh, is designed to do. It's also designed to make sure that the capacity of our hospitals is able to cope with what is coming into those hospitals. Um, we set out those um, priorities uh, back in March, that that is what we were trying to do, and of course to minimise death. It was those three priorities that we had uh, to the fore. So when in four weeks' time we come back to the situation, uh, ideally what we would want to see is that the R is below one, then we can lift the restrictions, and then we will still continue to have to do all of the basic things, social distancing, uh, making sure that we continue to wash our hands, to keep the virus under control in that fashion. We have to take these interventions now, Mr Speaker, because the virus has gone out of control in some places, and that's why we're having uh, to take these interventions, which I very much regret. Very much regret. None of this is something I come to the House with, with any joy today at all. We're interfering with people's lives. We're interfering with people's ability uh, to, to make money so that they can live. And we then have to try and support those people, and that is what we will have to focus on now in the coming days. And I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would like to uh, make a comment. The statement relies heavily on calls for responsible behaviour for all, and I wholeheartedly support that. But further to Mr. Nesbitt's earlier question, I'd like to ask the First Minister will extra resources or support? be provided to all of those who are assisted and charged with carrying out enforcement duties? Yes, well, we will uh, be continuing to work with uh, those people who want to help us on compliance uh, and on enforcement of the regulations. Um, we work with the Police Service of Northern Ireland. We're working with local government uh, in terms of our environmental health officers and indeed with health and safety executive and other issues. But I mean, to go back to the um, first point that the members made, personal responsibility is a wonderful thing. We've all been given free will. But I hope that people listening today will realise that if they do what we're asking them to do, then it has a consequence and it will help us to get the virus under control. I can make all of the restrictions that I want, but if people are not prepared to comply with them, then we're going to have a really serious problem uh, in a couple of weeks' time. And I do not want to be in that place, and I would urge all of the members to work with us so that we can deal with this terrible situation we find ourselves in. I'm going to call Doris Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Trigg, and I thank uh, the First Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, there are still some concerns um, around uh, schools, uh, First Minister, in terms of in the event that people have to be educated at home, will, will the uh, two-week period time frame be uh, used constructively by the Education Minister and others in relation to ensuring that children and young people from more deprived communities who don't have access to technology, who don't have access to the high cost of printing off papers, etc., so will additional support measures be given to those families in a very targeted way? I think the member makes a, a very relevant point because when our schools are closed, it is the children that she refers to that suffer. It is those children who don't have access to the internet, who don't have Wi-Fi, who perhaps have parents who aren't that interested in education, 
Um, the usual line is, if it was good enough for me, it's good enough for you, which frankly isn't good enough. And we need to make sure that our young people are in schools, because then they get the attention that they need from their teachers and from their peers. And I really do appeal to people to think about this. We need our young people in school, our vulnerable young people. It's a terrible thing to say, but some vulnerable young people, the safest place for them is in school. It's not in their homes. Uh, and therefore, to me, this is a, an absolute priority. And we have to ensure that our young people have schools to go to, have safe places to go to, and can then develop uh, as the young people that we want them to be. Members, that concludes questions on the statement. Thank you very much to all those who have contributed to this morning, and thanks to the First Minister and the Minister for Health for attending this session. Thank you. The, the Assembly uh, does adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Thank you.